Okay, welcome back. So let's talk today about sampling. Okay, sampling, we've, we've seen a little bit about sampling, and we've especially seen about you know, this relationship between populations and samples, why we have to take a sample. Right? All of these definitions should look familiar to you. Right? Our population is a large group that can answer a question for us. Okay, populations are usually pretty big, so we're not typically able to perform a census. We're not typically able to calculate parameters. Right? Parameters are usually what we're interested in to answer a question about the population. So since we can't get to the whole population, we have to take a sample, or subset of that population. We calculate statistics from that sample to give us estimates of those parameters we're looking for. All right, so that's the big idea, right? But the key is, well, we got to get a good sample here. We call a good sample a, a representative sample or an unbiased sample. All right? Another definition that we want to talk about here, new definition. Let's define what our sampling frame is. All right? Well, this is hopefully everyone in the population, right, who we could choose. So how do we get a good sample, and what do we mean by a good sample, or a representative sample? So what are our goals? Right, we want our data to actually answer the question that we're looking for. Right, we want that sample to be representative of the population. And we also want to minimize our cost, minimize resources. Right? Cost and resources, you think funding, you think money often when you when you talk about that, right? But it's also manpower, time, things like that. So if I had asked you what makes a sample a good sample, first thing you'd probably say is, well, we want a big sample. And yeah, sure, we want a big sample, right? But how big is big enough? Where's that balancing point where, you know, of course I've like thousands of people in my sample, but do I have the time, do I have the money to sample that many people? So I gotta balance my resources to get a sample that I'm happy with. So how do we do that? And what does a representative sample look like? Well, a representative sample minimizes bias, right? And in survey sampling methodology, we might define bias as just producing an untrue value, right? Lead, something that's leading us in the wrong direction. Right, the types that we'll talk about in this context are number one, measurement bias and sampling bias. I'm briefly talking about the differences between these two types of bias. Right, if I were to send out a survey, let's think about what has to go right. right number one, I have to have a good survey. Right? I have to have a good questionnaire. It has to be my data collection tool needs to be properly formatted. All right, so Measurement bias deals with the measurement tool itself. Is it collecting true, accurate data? If I send out a survey, number one, the survey has to be good, but number two, I gotta get that survey to the right people. Okay, if I don't get it to the right people, that can result in sampling bias. So I have to sample the right people, I also have to have my tool in good shape. All right, what can cause measurement bias? Right, well, here's how we might define measurement bias. Right, questions that aren't producing a true answer. Right, one big thing that results in measurement bias is often anecdotal evidence right, or just self-reporting data. Okay, that's an issue because, you know, whether we like to admit it or not, we're not always so honest with our answers. And maybe someone else knows you better than you think you know yourself. Okay, so self-reporting data isn't always the best way to go about it. Sometimes you can't get around it, but it's not always great. Right? There are also the obvious issues with wordings of questions, right? We if we we don't want to go into something trying to produce a certain answer, we don't want leading questions, non-neutral wording stuff like that. We also don't want it to be confusing because that's not going to give us good results. All right? We also want to think about the, the scales, the numbers, the precision that we use in writing our questions. All right? We don't want things that are going to produce missing data. Um, maybe if you've done a survey, a lot of surveys we see on a scale of one to five. 
what do you think about an issue? Agree to strongly agree, neutral, that kind of thing. The thing that you might answer a four on a scale of one to five, does that necessarily mean you would answer the same, you would answer an eight on a scale of one to 10? Do those translate? You would answer an 80 on a scale of one to 100, right? So the scale we use is important. Um, we don't want much missing data. All right, so we don't want measurement bias. We gotta make a good data collection tool. We also gotta get that tool to the right people. All right, so how do we get sampling bias? Well, some things that can result in sampling bias are, all right, so sampling bias is just not getting our survey or not sampling the correct people. All right, so how could that happen? Well, one way that can happen is this idea of a voluntary response sample, right? Well, so, you know, like just leaving a poll open for anybody to, to respond to. So why do you think there might be an issue with that? Well, typically if something's voluntary, right, it's just kind of the people who feel strongly either way that are going to respond to that, right? So in a lot of cases, it tends that the, the people that have the most strong opinions or the loudest tend to be the ones that are, that are hurt. I don't know if you've been on the internet lately, but that's kind of how it goes. All right, so voluntary response, sometimes it's the only way we can go, but we gotta, we got to take it with a grain of salt sometimes. All right, another way that we might get sampling bias is this idea of convenience sampling. So I don't want to just use who's convenient to me. If I want to know the thoughts of all students at a particular university, just using a single class may not be the best, most representative sample of opinions of that entire university. Okay, so we want to steer away from convenience sampling. We want to steer away from voluntary response sampling. Right, but how do we combat those? Well, you might say, okay, we'll give people some sort of incentive to do your survey. And that's fine in some cases, but that also can lead to issues, right? If you're getting an incentive for a survey, you may be more likely to respond favorably. So that's something to think about too. All right, some other kind of obvious issues. We don't want real small samples. And non-response is a, is a big issue also. Okay, so here's a figure that, that relates to non-responses, right? And we can really see through the time, through time, right? We see contact rate up here, which means are they, are people answering their phone or email or whatever it is that you're trying to reach out to them on? So we see contact rate going down over time, right? It's harder to get in touch with people. And if you do get in touch with someone, cooperation rate is going down as well. All right, so we see through time it's becoming more difficult to get good results here. So non-response is a big issue as well, right? Because there's certain demographics that are more or less likely to respond, to respond to things, and you also got to think about the medium of delivery, right? There's certain demographics that are more likely to respond to certain mediums, right? Uh, the younger demographic is, is never going to respond to a survey in the mail. Right? But the older de demographic is probably not going to respond to a survey on a Twitter poll or something like that. Okay, so you got to think about the medium with which you're, you're polling people. Right? You also got to think about your target demographic and how likely they are to respond. Okay, so these are all things to think about, and we're never going to get the, the perfect sample. Right? In, in general, bigger is always better. Right? But I, I always want to, maybe you can see how it's kind of a balancing act. right? You want to balance between, yes, maybe incentivizing is good in some cases. Maybe we should leave it voluntary. Right? But you always got to take things with a grain of salt. So if we could get the perfect sample, how would it look? Well, the perfect sample comes from this idea of simple random sample. Okay, so here's some notation that we want to introduce you to. So we see here 
big capital N. That's the number of people in our population. All right, we see lowercase n, that typically denotes our sample size. All right, so a simple random sample is where every single person in that population has the same chance of being picked for our sample. So that's one consideration for simple random sample. So I'm going into something and I know I need a certain sample size. Every single individual has the same chance of getting picked for that sample. And then I randomly choose one of those samples. Okay, so let's think about this with a simple example. Say my population of big N equal to 4, so A, B, C, D is my population. And I decide that I want a sample size of 2. Alright, so if, if you can kind of picture in your head what are all my possible samples of size 2, well it could be A, B, A, C, A, D, and so forth. So there's actually six possible samples you could take of size two from a population of four. And then I would randomly choose one. Maybe I put all six of these samples in a hat and I choose this one. And that's my random sample. So this is the idea of simple random sample. Now with a very small population like this, it's doable for a very small sample. Okay, but what if your population started getting big and you wanted larger samples. Well, these numbers would start getting pretty big pretty quickly. All right, so a computer can handle something like this, but oftentimes if we don't have access to that or we don't have all, a lot of resources, right, we might need to use some sort of other technique. Now a simple way of providing randomization in sampling is some sort of probability-based sampling or systematic sampling. I go down my sampling frame and I choose, say, every tenth person off that frame. Or I'm manufacturing a product. I choose every fifth item off the conveyor belt to measure. All right, systematic sampling is a, a decent way of getting a good sample. But what if you have a sample and, and you're worried about, well, I only have a limited sample size that I can take. What if I don't get equal representation among groups? Right, that's where this idea of stratified sampling comes in. Like if I had 100 people in a class, but I was only limited to taking a sample of size 10 from that class, if I took a sample of size 10, it's possible that I get all 10 males, right, or all 10 females. So what if I want equal representation in that group? Well, I could use this idea of stratified sampling. I could say, okay, here's a list of of females in the class. Here's a list of males in the class. So I'm going to randomly sample five males, randomly sample five females, and that's going to make up my entire sample. Right, you see stratified sampling used a lot of times when we're looking at studies that have to do with socioeconomic status, gender, things like that. Okay, Another technique that you can use to save yourself some time is cluster sampling. Okay, cluster sampling is where you look at a population and you see that this population is already naturally divided into groups in some way. All right, so if I went out and I looked in a town or looked in a city, yeah, I could go to all these different parts of the city and I could sample people all over. But what if I decide, okay, here's, I'm going to randomly choose one block in the city. And I'm just going to hope that that block is a good representation of the entire city. Right, so here's, here's a block over here. Looks pretty diverse. Let me just take that block, use that as my cluster, and that will be my sample. Okay, so that's the idea of cluster sampling. So again, simple random samples are the gold standard. They're the best that we can do, right? But if we can't get there, there's other ways we can go about it. All right, when we're sampling, when we're collecting data, there are always ethical things that we want to consider as well. Um, we're not going to get into these too much, but there are always things to think about. Right? Lots of times when you're doing projects, you're doing research, you have to go through an institutional review board. Right? You have to make sure people in your study are giving you consent. Right? You have to clearly tell them, you know, is this an anonymous survey? Is it confidential? Right? The difference there is, is important. Okay, so those are things to think about.
So finally, to kind of wrap all this up, whenever we see data, based on everything we now know about data collection, sampling, experimental design, observational studies, all this stuff, when I see a data set, I need to think about all these things, think about all these questions, right, and make sure that my data came in good faith, that my data is made up of a good sample. Because if it's not, and I go on to analyze it and use it for something important, my results aren't necessarily going to be valid. They're going to be in dispute. All right, so thank you for your time, and we'll see you next time.